thank you, Eric, and thank you to the Linda Hall Library for this invitation. I uh, wish that time has allowed uh, me to visit in person, and hopefully I can do that sometime. So yeah, so Eric uh, set it up pretty nicely. It's been, it's been more than a year since this landmark study was published in the journal Science. Uh, that documented the staggering loss of abundance, one in four birds gone since 1970. So in this talk, I'm gonna describe in a little detail the study, summarize some of the main results, and also talk about the incredible response that this paper has received, both in the media and the public, and some of the actions that are currently underway uh, now in what, what we're calling the road to recovery. So we're all here because we appreciate the wonder of birds. And besides bringing us joy, birds are also sensitive indicators of the health of, the, of our overall environment on which all wildlife and humans depend. So what does it mean to lose more than a quarter of the continent's birds in a single lifetime? Well, the declines of migratory birds are not new. And so we're gonna go back to this other moment in time for a second, more than 50 years ago, when Rachel Carson published the book Silent Spring, which helped to give birth to the modern environmental movement, resulted in the banning of harmful pesticides such as DDT. So Carson was a bird watcher, and some of the key evidence that she gathered for her book were the declines in birds that she saw. In fact, it even gave her the idea for, for the name of the book. But a friend of Rachel Carson was Chandler Robbins, who worked for the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And in response to Silent Spring, he had a vision to create the North American Breeding Bird Survey in 1966 as a means of tracking changes in bird populations across the continent. So the BBS remains our primary source of data on bird populations today. And it was Robbins' own analysis in 1989 of the initial data that sounded the alarm for the declines of many bird species, especially a group that we call neotropical migrants that are shown in that uh, slide. All the red areas show declining populations across 156 species of birds. So more recently, we've put out these state of the birds reports in the US and Canada, and we've presented the population trends of birds as indicators of overall environmental health. And the indicator, lo indicator lines represent the average population trends across groups of species. So we've seen declines in grassland birds, forest birds, increases in wetland birds, and so on. So what, are the, what these indicators don't tell us is the number of birds lost or gained, or whether the total abundance of birds has actually changed. So this was the basic question that we posed at the beginning of our study. If we take into account both increasing and decreasing species, did we see a net change in bird population abundance? Are there fewer birds today than, than there were at the start of the BBS around 1970? Or are we seeing a shift towards increasing habitat generalists, urban adaptive invasive species of birds? So to answer this question, we needed to compile the most reliable estimates of both population trends and population size for as many species as possible. And this was a huge job in itself. So we relied on long-term monitoring data sets from both citizen scientists, the BBS being our main source, and also the Christmas bird count for birds that are, you know, you can really only see in the wintertime, as well as professional biologists. So aerial surveys of waterfowl, for example. And we're very lucky to have this 50-year data set. It really doesn't exist for any other group of organisms. And it's, it represents an incredible collaboration between scientists and birders. So just a little bit of the methodology. Um, basically, we compiled the best data available for each species. And again, synthesizing these data sets and getting them into the right format for analysis was a huge job. It took us almost the whole first year of the project. But it resulted in both trend and population size estimates for 529 species of birds. And then these data were combined into a pretty complicated statistical model that first looked at the, the different individual groups of birds separately. So in the upper left, you have 
boreal birds that migrate to South America, and you can see that declining trend, and and so on. And then all of these were combined into a single, um, what we call a hierarchical model of population change. And I'm, I'm happy to answer uh, questions about the methodology later. But even because even the best survey data still rely on human observers, we wanted a completely independent measure of bird abundance. So we turned to weather radar, which as you probably know, can see and measure the magnitude of migration in the sky over the United States. So in this image, you can see as that weather front uh, moves eastward across the United States, behind it are these round bluish green blooms that appear right there. Those are migratory birds that the radar is picking up. And by adding up the data from 143 of these NEXRAD weather radars across the US, which was another huge data set that required supercomputers to analyze, um, our co-author, Adrian Doctor, who's also at the Cornell lab, but he he's, has an aerial ecology research project. And so he was able to get a measure of the total cumulative passage of bird migration over the entire spring season and then could look back through time to see if that total biomass had changed. So what were these results? You probably already have an idea. When we ran the numbers, the results of all this were staggering and sobering. Across 529 species, we saw a net population loss of 2.9 billion birds since 1970. This represents a 29% reduction in the total breeding bird abundance across the avifauna, and more than 300 species showed a loss in their population. So we broke these results down for groups of species in several ways, such as across major breeding habitats or biomes as shown in this slide with a map there on, in the upper right. Um, so on this slide, the absolute change in abundance for each biome is graphed in the left panel and the relative change in abundance is shown by the bars in the center. So when we look across these biomes, we see a net loss in nearly all habitats, including habitat generalists. The largest loss, both in absolute and relative terms, was in grassland birds, which were the gold-colored lines. The loss of 700 million, more than half of all grassland birds lost since 1970. We also estimated that in the boreal forests, which are the dark green lines, has lost half a billion birds in that same time period. The only biome to show a moderate increase was wetland birds. But as you can see, these don't come close to compensating for the losses. And this is because wetland bird populations are much smaller than most terrestrial bird populations. All wetland birds combined don't even add up to the population of a single sparrow or warbler or say the American robin. Now, if we break the results down more finely by taxonomic bird families, we see that there are winners and losers. So in this figure, the wheel graphs represent the absolute change in abundance within each family. The red wheel for families that show a net loss in abundance <clears throat> and the blue wheel for families that show a net gain. So the cool thing is that the size of the wheels are proportional. So there is a total loss of 3.2 billion birds and a total gain of only 250 million. And a majority of the loss has occurred in several large bird families, such as sparrows, warblers, and blackbirds. Although 38 families showed a net population loss, and 10 families have lost more than 50 million birds. On the gain side, 29 families showed a net gain. And among the biggest winners were waterfowl, and raptors, and vireos. So this is probably the strangest result. Um, why a bird like the red-eyed vireo, which is a neotropical migrant that breeds in our forests and migrates all the way to the Amazon basin every year and back, why that bird should be showing, uh, uh, and other vireos show steady increase while others are declining. These are this, so there's still a lot of mysteries in, in this data set. But perhaps the most surprising result is that half of the total net loss is made up of 10 very common and widespread species. Horned lark, dark-eyed junco, savanna sparrow, red-winged blackbird, 
They're examples of familiar birds that have lost hundreds of millions of individuals to their population. So bird population declines and loss are not just restricted to rare and threatened species, but they're pervasive among common and familiar species. In fact, some of the steepest declines and largest loss of individuals have occurred in several introduced species, especially the much maligned house sparrow and European starling. So perhaps we shouldn't be surprised since these species are experiencing uh, steep declines within their, their native ranges as well. And some people might say, well, isn't that a good thing if, if these birds are declining here? But this is also telling us that if we can't even sustain house sparrows and starlings and rock pigeons populations on our landscape, then something is very wrong. The results of the radar analysis were equally disturbing. We were able to go back 11 years to look at changes in total migration. And here the red circles indicate individual radar stations that saw a significant decline in spring migration over the past decade. And it's mostly in the central and eastern US, west of that gray shaded area. Uh, the trends were really too weak or variable to show a statistical pattern. But if we combine that trend surface with the cumulative biomass uh, passage, we get a surface of loss of biomass of spring migration over the, over the US. And the largest loss in migration, uh, again, we're in the eastern half of the US in the Mississippi and Atlantic flyways, whereas there was no significant change in migration over the western flyways. And we found an overall decline in spring migration biomass, a loss of about 14% since 2007, which translated to about 1.5% per year, which is about the same magnitude of decline we saw from the survey data. So these two independent sources of data indicate the same massive loss of birds. So why does this matter? Why do we care about the loss of these uh, common birds? Well, for people who love birds in nature, this is a tragedy. It's sad to see the loss of, of such familiar birds. But keeping common birds common also makes conservation sense for several reasons. First, we know that species decline before they become endangered or go extinct. So we have the lesson of the passenger pigeon, perhaps the most abundant bird ever to live in, in North America, there were estimated 3 billion passenger pigeons. So we've lost a passenger pigeon's worth of birds in less than our lifetime. And the decline of the passenger pigeon probably looked a lot like the declines we're seeing in many other species right now. People might not have even noticed if there were 29% fewer passenger pigeons. Um, but if monitoring had been in place, and we may have been able to detect that decline, society may have been able to prevent the extinction of the passenger pigeon. So the loss of abundance in common and widespread species also signals loss of ecosystem integrity, the diminishing of the spectacle of migration, and they parallel the declines in birds, insects, and other taxa that we're seeing globally. So what are the primary causes of these declines? Well, our, our study did not specifically address the causes, and these are not easy to pin down for individual species. But we know from lots of other evidence that habitat loss and degradation are the primary drivers of bird declines by far. So a common theme in the largest declines that we saw, grassland birds, plus other common species of open fields, such as ripping blackbirds, is that these are birds associated with agricultural landscapes. So what we're seeing with intensification of agriculture is where not too long ago there were fallow fields, grassy margins, hedgerows, it's now horizon to horizon cornfields or other crops, with also more intensive use of more toxic pesticides. So this combined with urban sprawl, loss of tropical forests where many of these our birds are going to migrate, we're seeing every bit of nature squeezed out to the point where our landscapes cannot support basic bird populations. And on top of this are the many human-caused factors that we know kill huge numbers of birds. These might not be the primary drivers of the declines, 
but they make it more difficult for birds to survive in the remaining habitats. And these are all things that we can do something about. We have proven solutions for minimizing this human-caused mortality. But because the declines are so pervasive across so many habitats and groups of birds, we know these birds are facing multiple interacting threats. And many of these are difficult still for us to measure, such as pesticides, energy development, light pollution from cities, the increasing frequency of extreme weather, and all being exacerbated by climate change. So that is a lot of doom and gloom. Uh, one of the most frequent questions we get, however, is did our study provide any reasons for hope? And the answer is yes, we do have reasons for hope. Bird populations can be resilient. We have many examples of where conservation has been successful. Uh, first is the remarkable recovery of the bald eagle and other birds of prey. Once we removed DDT from the environment and reduced or eliminated direct persecution from shooting these birds, their populations have continued to increase. Perhaps the most hopeful example is the increase in waterfowl populations, more than a 50% increase over the same time period since 1970. And this is not an accident. It was the waterfowl hunters who noticed the population declines and they did something about it. They raised their voices, put money where their mouths are. And the result were policies and a dedicated funding stream that has protected and restored millions of acres of wetlands. And duck populations rebounded, providing sustainable recreational hunting. So a really big question for us moving forward is how can we replicate these successes for other birds? So another reason for hope, I think, is the phenomenal response that we did get to the publication of our paper. There were hundreds of articles from press outlets in the US and beyond, front page headlines in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, more than 1,700 media outlets carry this story with a reach of 3.8 billion people. And as I did, so many of these media interviews, which is not really my thing, after the publication of the paper, every reporter asked the same question. What can people do to help birds? So in response to the science publication, a coalition of bird conservation organizations came together, including the, the organizations from the paper authors, plus groups like Audubon and others, and launched uh, a bird crisis campaign, really, to sound the alarm and promote action. And they created this shared partner website called 3billionbirds.org. The 3billionbirds.org site is where anybody can come and get more details on the findings of the paper, including downloading a copy of the science paper itself. In addition, the site points people to solutions, mostly in the form of seven simple actions. All of these actions are things that individuals can do that can make a difference for birds. And each of these are actions that people can take to a larger scale by being active in their communities or ultimately creating change at the policy or societal level. So action number one is to reduce mortality from glass windows. Windows kill an estimated 200 million birds a year in the US alone. And it's not just skyscrapers. Most of the mortality takes place at residential windows where birds see the reflections of vegetation and make the fatal decision to fly through the window. But there are many proven solutions for making windows safer for birds, including several products that break up the reflections so birds can see the windows, and measures to turn off lights in cities um, during periods of peak migration. And that's the big lights out campaign that's happening right now in several cities. And legislation can also work, and make, make it, like making it mandatory that all federal buildings use bird-friendly glass design as a start. And um, this is the Bird Safe Windows Act, which is before Congress right now. And in fact, on the day that our paper was published, uh, we received a YouTube video from the office of Republican Congressman uh, Griffiths from Virginia, who was in a debate about the Bird Safe Windows Act 
And he basically held up the press release from the Cornell lab and declared that we don't need any more debate on this issue. And so we're pretty optimistic that these changes are going to occur. The second action is a bit more controversial. And that is that we know that outdoor cats kill more than 2 billion birds per year and an even larger number of small mammals and reptiles in the US. Yet society refuses to solve this problem and the number of feral and outdoor cats continues to soar. But again, there are known solutions such as catios that allow cats to go outdoors without hunting birds. But the standard practice is still trap neuter release or TNR, which essentially creates subsidized colonies of bird killers, often in parks and other public lands. Other countries such as New Zealand are aggressively dealing with this epidemic of invasive predators. And it's time that the US and Canada follow suit. The next action is an obvious one. Use native plants in your yards and parks and reduce the amount of lawn. There are 40 million acres of cultivated lawn in the US. That's three times a greater area than any irrigated crop, including corn. And not only are lawns sterile environments for insects and, and other animals, but they require harmful chemicals to maintain. <clears throat> So planting natives attract pollinators and other insects, provide food and nesting sites for birds. An urban green space can be beneficial for birds. Some breeding birds um, will use urban environments, but mainly it's for stopover habitats during migration or for birds in, in winter. Number four, Reducing the use of pesticides and other chemicals is something that individuals can do around homes and yards, but more intensive use of more and more toxic pesticides for agriculture could be one of the largest global environmental issues we face. There are common pesticides called neonicotinoids, and that really could be the next DDT, and have been implicated in global declines in insect populations, as well as in aerial insectivore and grassland birds. But the growing human population needs food, so this is not an easy problem to fix. But there are alternatives to industrial scale agricultural production, and one of the solutions is for us to pay attention to where our food comes from. One of the simplest actions is to drink bird friendly coffee. So I was surprised in the many media interviews that I, that I did uh, after the paper was published, I was amazed that, that nobody seemed to know anything about bird friendly coffee. All the coffee we drink is grown in tropical regions and in most areas tropical rainforests are cleared to grow the coffee. But rustic varieties of coffee are still grown under a canopy of shade which leaves enough le trees to provide critical habitat for migratory birds on their wintering grounds as well as many tropical resident species. So what's nice is that shade grown coffee is great coffee. And paying attention to certifications for shade grown and trying to get your local coffee shops to serve shade grown coffee is a great way to help birds. So the gold standard for certification is the Smithsonian's Bird Friendly Coffee. And uh, this bird friendly coffee model is now expanding into a coalition of bird friendly products and practices and lifestyle choices. So you could get bird friendly beef and bird friendly wood products. Okay, reducing the use of <clears throat> plastics is one thing that society has made some progress on because of all the publicity around the effects on marine life and such as the island of plastic garbage in the Pacific. But for birds, the main concern is with seabirds that mistake small bits of plastic for prey items and sometimes travel hundreds of miles on feeding trips only to then regurgitate the plastic prey into their chicks which then die of starvation with their bellies filled with plastic. So thankfully, there are more and more alternatives to single use plastics and many places have ordinances that mandate the use of reusable bags or other alternatives. The last of the seven simple actions people can take is to contribute data. Our study relied on citizen science monitoring programs with much of the data collected by volunteer birders. 
Birders are the eyes of the world. eBird is a relatively new program that is growing exponentially. Now, while we couldn't use eBird data to study the trends of species going back 50 years, eBird is going to be more and more important in the future for tracking bird populations at really fine scales and throughout the year, and also allowing us to evaluate the success of future conservation actions. But we know individual actions alone <clears throat> are not enough to bring back 3 billion birds. We also need to see broad scale change. We're hoping that our paper and the response it's gotten will continue to serve as a catalyst for change. What are we gonna do about this loss? Business as usual isn't working. We, we, we just really need to reimagine bird conservation in the 21st century. So what does this mean to reimagine bird conservation? Well, the main thing is we need to be much more strategic and focused on where we implement conservation actions. We've been addressing broad scale threats, habitat needs, but in most cases, we don't really know the specific causes of species declines. So to be more strategic, we need a better idea of what the limiting factors are, where and when in the annual cycle of these birds that, that these factors are active. So there's a lot going on now in the bird conservation world, and uh, including this new science that I'm gonna talk about that we're promoting in the road to recovery, but it's in the context of big new opportunities that are in front of us today that really weren't present 10 years ago or even five years ago. And, and these are being referred to as the five game changers that can help us change business as usual to frame our response to three billion birds lost. <clears throat> so things like this unprecedented coalition that came together, um, new roadmaps for population recovery and full annual cycle conservation, a bold new legislative agenda, for example. So one of the game changers is the advances in the science itself, especially technological, methodological advances that enable us to determine the specific causes of declines, what we're calling the smoking guns. And this needs to happen on a species by species basis, because even species in the same habitat have different biology and are under different threats throughout their annual cycle. So our approach involves deciding which species to focus on first, targeting research to fill the critical knowledge gaps that we have to determine these limiting factors, figuring out how to collect the data we, we need using new research and existing data sources, and then making sure that this new information makes, makes it into conservation plans and to managers who can implement these actions on the ground. And we refer to, we refer to this process as the road to recovery. So to identify the highest priority species to apply this road to recovery approach, we looked for species that met three criteria. They needed to be already species that we knew were of high concern. And for this, we used a, an assessment database that Partners in Flight has put together. They need to be species that showed steep declines based on our science paper results. So showing at least a 50% loss in their population. And we use new metrics of urgency that essentially projected the recent trends forward to see which species are expected to lose another 50% of their population in the near future. So this process resulted in about 40 species that meet all three criteria based on the data that we've got and another 34 species or so that probably meet the criteria but are data deficient. And these are the species most likely to slip into threatened and endangered status in the near future and for which it is imperative that we identify and address the specific causes of decline. So the species that are on this R2R Road to Recovery list is, they're not a surprise. They're, they're most of the grassland birds, uh, many shorebird species, seabirds, which have not gotten very much attention. Um, some of the more specialized forest birds like golden wing warbler, cerulean warbler, birds in arid land habitats in the West, such as sage grouse, and this group of aerial insectivores that include 
swifts and swallows and nighthawks. So next, we need to assess <clears throat> each species in terms of where it is along this road to recovery. For a majority of species, we have little to no information in terms of why they're actually declining. So even in grosbeak, it's a bird that's um, actually an eruptive species that's, that's here in the northeastern US this year, but in much lower numbers than, than they used to be, this bird has lost almost 90% of its population and people don't really have any idea why it has declined. Other species, such as whippoorwill, there's a working group that's formed, there's monitoring programs and research going on, but we still know very little about their declines. Then we have a bird like the golden winged warbler, where there's a whole initiative in terms of research and planning on both the breeding and the wintering grounds, but we still don't really know exactly where the species is most limited. Then we have a bird like the salt marsh sparrow on the Atlantic coast, where there was just this um, implementation strategy that was released with specific management actions and costs associated with them to address what's been identified as the key limiting threat, which is sea level rise. So it remains to be seen whether that kind of a um, recovery plan can actually work. But what we're trying to get to is a bird like the Kirtland's warbler, where the limiting factors were identified, they're being addressed, the species is recovering, and this is an example of a bird that's recently been taken off of the U.S. endangered species list. So the important point and how this is different from past efforts to manage habitat or address broad threats is that we are really focusing on recovering populations. And so to advance the necessary science, we've hosted a series of workshops in the past uh, six months or so. They're brought together several hundred experts. The first workshop in July focused really mostly on the concepts and approaches for understanding population limitation and causes of decline. And the second workshop in December focused on these new technologies and methods for identifying uh, linked populations, studying migratory connectivity, and collecting the demographic data we need to advance species towards recovery. So participants shared exciting new research, such as Calandra Stanley's tracking of yellow-billed cuckoos, and it shows that from birds from across their broad breeding range converge on a very small area in the Gran Chaco of Argentina, Bolivia, and Paraguay, an area that's being rapidly cleared for agriculture. And this is something we just didn't know until very recently. Um, another really cool study by Kristen Rueg uh, called the Genescape Project that's, uh, that's mapping genetic variation across widespread bird species in order to link breeding and wintering ground regions. But once we have the new science, figure out what's causing the declines and where and when to target conservation actions, that's when the real work of conservation begins. And fortunately, we have a large array of conservation tools to work with. From this new generation of conservation plans that are using more of a business planning approach, provide roadmaps for species recovery, um, to a wide range of programs that deliver habitat conservation on the ground, such as the Farm Bill, which we highlighted in the 2017 State of the Birds report. The Farm Bill is the largest source of conservation funds in the US. And these programs can develop lasting solutions in working food producing landscapes that are also critical for sustaining healthy populations of these steeply declining grassland birds. To uh, public-private partnerships called migratory bird joint ventures that are now throughout North America that bring together government agencies, NGOs, industry uh, to implement regional-based conservation. And at the state level, so each state has its own wildlife action plan, and Missouri is actually a very progressive state in terms of non-game wildlife. Uh, Sarah Kendrick is the state ornithologist. I don't know if any of you know her. She's a great example of the next generation of bird conservationists, and she's been active in our road to recovery effort. And she has a whole bunch of projects going, like the translocation of brown-headed nuthatches, 
into the pine woods of, of the Ozarks after restoring this. This is a bird that had, hadn't been there in a hundred years, had disappeared because of um, prevention of fire. And, and so by using fire to restore the habitat, they were able to create this habitat and then translocate birds from Arkansas that are now repopulating the Ozarks. So just a, another great example of local success. But to reimagine bird conservation, though, we, we also need to rethink the policies that protect birds. So now is not the time to weaken legal protections for migratory birds. That's the latest interpretation of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act uh, has done since 2017. And un under this change, which the current administration is trying to undo, Companies are no longer subject to prosecution or fines, even after a disaster like the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2010 that destroyed or injured about a million birds and for which BP oil company paid $100 million in fines. And this is just one of the many bedrock environmental policies that have been rolled back over the past four years and, and should make us very angry. But the Migratory Bird Treaty Act is more than 100 years old. So even without these rollbacks, it doesn't really provide adequate protections for migratory birds that are moving across the entire hemisphere. So we need to rethink these protections. And some of the new legislation that's in the works include the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, which we highlighted in last year's State of Birds report. And this is, this is a legislation that would create a brand new funding stream to the states to conserve non-game wildlife and address what, what really is a, a tremendous disparity that still exists where almost all the funding, 90% of the funding in most agencies are going to game or hunted species. And the rest of all this declining birds and other wildlife are really sort of fighting for um, less than 10% of the funds. And so this legislation would create uh, this huge new funding stream to the states. And some completely new ideas like a songbird conservation stamp that, that can parallel the highly successful duck stamp, which has raised billions of dollars for wetland protection and waterfowl conservation. We need similar success in other bird habitats. But ultimately to accomplish this broad scale change, people who love birds in nature need to become a political force. We already are a huge economic force, contributing $41 billion annually to the economy. But we now need to put all of this in the context of current events. Um, one of the things about the pandemic is that we've seen a dramatic increase in outdoor activities and awareness of nature and birds and pollinators a huge spike in citizen science programs like eBird. And also this increased awareness now of social justice and diversity issues in birding and in conservation organizations and agencies. Events like Black Birders Week are literally changing the face of bird conservation. So these are tremendous opportunities that have developed in what is otherwise very challenging and uncertain time. How do we best embrace these changes and weave them into the road to recovery efforts? And with the political transition that's now occurring, now is really a good time to put nature and the environment back on the political agenda. So now that we've gotten everyone's attention with, with the science paper and everything since then, it's time to think about what all of us can do to help bring back 3 billion birds. I do believe that this is still a moment in time for conservation, perhaps another moment like Silent Spring, that has the chance to help change the national consciousness and the trajectory needed to save birds and our environment. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. And then we'll stop sharing. That, that was a uh, that was a fascinating talk, Dr. Rosenberg. The, the numbers are staggering. I know you had three billion in the title of the talk, but just to hear it broken down, like you know, I wrote it down like two hundred million birds are killed 
by the windows each year. I just, that blew my mind. Uh, that's just a staggering number. Um, it's hard to believe, uh, you know, when, when you put it, the numbers out there like that. Uh, and if, if anyone has a question, uh, you'll see a Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. Just type your questions in there. If you're watching on Facebook, just type your questions in the comment sections and I'll, I'll keep my eye on Facebook. Uh, we'll begin with, uh, actually someone posted in chat uh, and, and I was thinking the same thing. Let me find it here. It, it was a question about wind turbines. Um, are they a danger to bird populations? Well, they are a danger. Uh, you know, everything is relative as, as we see from these numbers. And so at least so far, you know, the numbers of birds killed at wind farms is pretty tiny compared with some of these other mortality factors, but that doesn't mean it's not important, especially locally in different flyways and for different species. And, you know, with the plans to exponentially increase wind power and some of these en other energy sources, it could become a, a bigger and bigger issue. So the answer is, of course, not, we're not against wind power, but all of these new energy sources need to be developed in very smart ways. I mean, we can't, trade one problem for another. And wind power is a very important part of the climate solution, but there are, there are ways, there are places to site wind turbines that are less um, dangerous to birds and there are times of the year when you can you know, shut them down. So the, these, measures, these measures are out there and we're hoping that wind power can proceed, but in as safe a way as possible for birds. Leslie has a question, uh, she writes, uh, or he, uh, I'm interested in the role that humans, human made sound plays in the potential disturbance of established bird populations and habitats. Has your research come across? Uh, well, there, there have been some interesting studies about um, how birds adjust their, their, the frequency of their song and loudness of their song, like in urban areas in response to noise. And there was this fascinating study that maybe this person or some, may, you, you may have seen uh, just in the past few months, it was on NPR and other places where they actually found that, that because it's so much quieter during this pandemic year, just the reduction in the fewer airplanes and cars, that the birds have responded very positively by increasing their singing rates and sing and, and so, you know, it's hard to say whether that has a population effect on birds, but um, but possibly, and it's all, it's all cumulative. Someone writes, uh, how can a bird fly through a forest easily and not be able to mess the slow moving wind blades of, of a wind turbine? And, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, that's a common question. I mean, I forget what the number is, but it's very deceiving. The, the speed of the tip of the wing blade is actually I don't want to throw out the wrong number there, but it's so much faster than, than you would believe. And, you know, if a bird is flying through airspace and is not used to, so it's not necessarily the forest birds that are, that are you know, being hit by the, the wind farms. It's birds that are in open country and, and raptors that are used to flying in the open sky. And they're just not, not perceiving this danger. And it's even worse for bats because it messes up their echolocation and they, they literally can't perceive that moving blade. And a lot of birds fly at night, right? Do they migrate at night? And is well, that most true? Bird, most birds migrate at night. So that's why the, and I should have mentioned this, that the weather radar data is only night migration. That's what it's picking up. Um, so yeah, and so that's why birds are disoriented by lights. They could be attracted to the lights in the wind farms, for example. So, you know, a lot of things that could kind of come together, a lot of, a lot of dangers out there for birds. Uh, all right, Carol has a question about industrial ag. Uh, what conversations are going on, or are conversations going on regarding glyphosate use in industrial agricultural states? 
Are you familiar with that? Oh boy, um, that's not really my area. I'm okay. not sure if those are those are different from the neo. Maybe those are similar to the neonicotinoids, or if somebody knows that. Um, there, there are a lot of studies and, and discussions going on right now with, with agricultural industries, and, and there's a huge um, tri-national grassland bird effort that have brought the agricultural interests and food producers to the table. And so there are a group of people looking at solutions. Um, I'm not as familiar with the pesticide stuff specifically. And uh, Sean writes, that there was a recent paper out of Europe that suggested painting one turbine blade black significantly reduces collisions. And he, he hasn't seen any black blades here in the U.S. yet, but... Um, I wonder if Sean one. was at my last talk, because that was the exact same okay. uh, question. I did see that report. I haven't read the study. There are also these incredible, if you've seen them, these bladeless wind turbines, you know, that are essentially just the tower that, that spins. Mm -hmm. And so there could be some, you know, by the time we figure out where to put them, there could actually be a real solutions to reducing. I mean, birds can still collide with the tower itself and they're also uh, colliding with the, you know, the cables that are carrying the energy. So it's not just the blades, but it, it certainly can be reduced. Uh, and so it's very encouraging to see some of these measures being applied. Do air collisions mean that restoring habitats around airports should be discouraged? Air collisions with planes? Um, no, actually, there's it's sort of a counterintuitive answer there that most of the birds responsible for air strikes are flocking birds that actually are attracted to the mowed lawns. And if grasslands were restored, if it was 18 inch high prairie grass around the airports, you'd have all these sparrows hidden down in the grass and they wouldn't fly more than 10 feet over the ground. So there have been studies that show that it would actually greatly reduce um, collision risk to have real habitat around rather than these open lawns that are attracting flocks of starlings and geese and those sorts of things. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, it's always, you always hear about geese striking planes. Uh, it's, it's never a sparrow <laughs> or anything like that. Um, again, everyone, if you have a question for Dr. Rosenberg, uh, you'll see a Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. Type your question in there. And if you're watching on Facebook, type your question in the comment section. And I want to ask you about uh, a, a certain species, uh, the red-headed woodpecker. Is that, a, is that a species in decline? I, it is. It, it's actually one of the few woodpeckers that's declining. It's also one of the few woodpeckers that's migratory. Most of our woodpeckers are year-round residents and they seem to be doing pretty well, but red-headed woodpecker is kind of a specialist and it, it actually depends pretty heavily on acorns in the winter. So most of them migrate down into the bottomland hardwood forests of the southeastern U.S. and live on acorns and they, they'll actually store the acorns in the bark and then retrieve them and live on those all winter. So I'm again, I'm not saying that that's the cause of the decline, but that is one of the um, steeply declining species. It's something I've been thinking about. Every, I, I remember as a kid, and this is back in, you know, in the 70s, uh, early 80s, that uh, I used to see a lot more of them and I just don't see many anymore. Yep, yep, they're one of the one of the declining species for sure. I mean, Fred has a question about light pollution. Uh, is uh, you know the increased urbanization and, and the light pollution that comes with it? Does that affect bird populations? Yeah, there's been some really fascinating, very recent studies that have kind of looked at look at the increase in 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 light. At, at night, you know, through urban areas and how that's increased just over the last 10, 20 years. And studies that are, that are showing how birds are disoriented, I mean, in mass, like whole populations of birds can be essentially attracted to the city lights. And there's a, there's a great program that's going right now called um, Lights Out. And uh, 
folks can go to birdcast.org to find out about this. So it, it's using that radar technology um, to predict when the big flights are gonna happen in a given area and then alert the residents of that city and then urge people to turn off their lights um, for that night. And there's evidence to sh show that that can have a huge, um, you know, local immediate effect. What was that website again? Birdcast. Birdcast. Dot org. Dot org. Okay. And it's uh, lights out is what it's called. That's interesting. Uh, we, have, we have a question on Facebook. Uh, someone who lives in in the Kansas City uh, city, uh, Linda writes, we have many owls in Waldo. Uh, it's a neighborhood in Kansas City. Are they overpopulated in the area? Uh, but that kind of, you talked about that, how, how some, you know, not every, there are a few species um, that are not in decline, that uh, some of the birds okay. of prey yeah, so birds of prey, mm -hmm. it's interesting. So two things have happened, um, well, a couple of things. One is the pesticide issue and the fact that people aren't shooting them anymore. But the other thing that's happened is birds of prey, raptors, so hawks and owls seem to have adapted to urban areas. And this is a pretty recent phenomenon. You know, there's a famous story about the red-tailed hawk that nested in New York City on, on Park Avenue. And, but that's happening more and more, sort of, species after species is moving into the city. And owls, owls are one of them. Now, I don't know, it doesn't mean they're overpopulating, but it does mean that they're taking advantage of all the food, um, you know, so it's probably a, a, a pretty good thing uh, for reducing squirrel and rat populations. But, but yeah, it's really interesting how some of these birds that you would think would be, you know, and around the world, they tend to be uh, hunted and, and in decline, but in North America, some of the large birds, the birds of prey, fish-eating birds, you know, pelicans, cranes, all these things, herons, egrets, they're all doing very well. And it's really the small birds that are, that are most in danger. Well, you mentioned the bald eagle too, the, the remarkable recovery story with the bald eagle. And it's amazing to me, um, again, referencing my childhood, there, it was, you, you never saw, rarely saw an eagle in, in the Midwest. And now um, there's a lake, Crash there's a lake north of, uh, north of town here that you go out in the winter and, and there would be 30 or 40 of them out there. And it's just amazing. And, and they fly in the city along the Missouri River and Kansas Rivers, you see them yeah. Yeah. driving to and work. Peregrine falcons nesting on yeah. the buildings and all exactly. on the telephone poles. So yeah, I mean, the birds, they don't really mind people as long as we don't kill them, you know? That's right. <laughs> uh, right here's a question about insects. Uh, years ago, I would see lots of bugs flying around lights at night. Are the insect numbers decreased so much that I don't see those bugs anymore? Yes. And um, is that part of that is, and, and yeah, yeah, there's some, again, in the last couple of years, some fascinating studies, and there was a, there was a really interesting podcast about that, I forget where I heard that, but yeah, w one of the studies in Europe, that's actually how they monitored the insects, was looking at, you know, bugs killed on windshields, and you used to, if you were driving cross-country, yeah, when we were kids, you'd just get completely splattered with insects, it just doesn't happen anymore, so and it's especially the large insects that have really declined. And that's what we think a lot of these, you know, aerial insectivore birds are most dependent on. So that's a, that's a global phenomenon. That's even been found like in the Amazon where they're not actually spraying, but they're affected by these global wind patterns carrying pesticides around the globe. And Leslie writes in chat, you mentioned the red-tailed hawk in, uh, in New York City. Uh, Leslie writes, in New York City, a pair of red-tailed hawks produce three offspring every year in the window of the NYU president's office, high above Washington Square. So yeah, there's another example. They're not, yeah, they're not afraid pair. of people. Yeah, that's a different pair. Yeah, but they're, yeah, we have a, we have a, a Cornell has a cam 
you know, on the pair that nests on the buildings in the Cornell campus. So that's become a very popular thing is kind of people spending their whole day at work uh, watching these birds in the cam. I love watching those webcams. Um, right, we're about to the top of the hour. So due to the time, let's make this the last question. Um, and you, you may have touched on this in your presentation, but uh, Eleanor has a question. What's the status of the reconsideration of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act? Yeah, well, it's still in flux. I mean, one of the first things that the new administration wanted to do was reverse that rule. But and again, it's, it's some arcane legal thing that was going on, but that they couldn't. So the, the rule went into effect and they're working on legislation now that would restore those protections. But there actually are active lawsuits by the states against the US Fish and Wildlife Service because the states are claiming the damage to migratory birds by, by removing that, what's called the incidental take rule. So it gets pretty technical. I mean, I, I'm optimistic that it is all gonna uh, go back and maybe even go back to something that surpasses the protections that, that birds had. There's, there's new legislation up that's actually called the Migratory Bird uh, Protection Act. So not just an interpretation of the treaty, but actual legislation that would, that would you know, put some of those specific protections into law so that they cannot be reinterpreted by each administration back and forth. That'll be something interesting to follow in, in, the, in the coming weeks and months. Yeah. Uh, all right, Dr. Rosenberg, thank you so much for just a wonderful talk. Uh, it, you were right, it wasn't all doom and gloom. There's some hope. I hope, I hope there was hope. Yeah. All right, well, thanks. Thanks very much. I wish I could see everybody. I, I'm, I'm picturing a huge rounding of applause in the audience. Yeah. So. Um, we'll have to bring it to the library someday. Um, yeah. Okay. And, well, uh, great. Well, thank you very much. And thanks, everybody, for, for listening.